All right, welcome into Sports Bit. Betty and Insight today, Thursday, July 21st. We finished the AFC East with the New York Jets. Play of the day coming up, of course, big game breakdown. We always start with bad beats and bad bets. And how about a bad beat for the sports books? They got roughed up for the second night in a row with baseball, and the Yankees did them in here. Probably the biggest line move of the season as the Orioles' word started to leak out that the team was sick. Yeah, oh, I mean, this was steam like <laughs> as, as heavy as steam gets. When you're talking about a line move from minus 135 up to minus 220 higher at a couple of books, wow, that, folks, is some serious. Steam, you said it was the biggest move this season. I think it was the biggest line move that I've tracked so far this season. But it had everything to do with that uh, flu virus going around the Orioles clubhouse. They were without Matt Wieters. They were without Chris Davis. Manny Machado didn't play. And, of course, Buck Showalter didn't show up at the ballpark. And then Adam Jones left the game with back spasms after it already started. So, you know, the first Yankees batter reached base in the first inning, and he scored. That was all they needed. Disaster for the books with the Yankees-Orioles game. Same thing with the Cubs. A, 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 a bigger than a 40-cent move in this one. The Rizzo home run was all they needed. The first one, Big Sexy didn't have much. Cologne got roughed up, and Hendricks delivers again at home. Yeah, Anthony Rizzo with that two-run dinger in the first. And again, a huge line move. Minus 165 up to minus 210. Rizzo hits the two-run dinger. It's 2 nothing in the first by the third batter that the, the Mets had faced, that Cologne had faced. Ball game over. Never got any better. For the Mets or for the books, as you mentioned, you know, uh, kind of continuing the theme that we talked about yesterday. Yeah, and yesterday uh, it was the Pirates, Yankees, and Red Sox, all heavy steam that got there uh, two nights ago uh, with the Major League Baseball. What do you think of the Montgomery trade for the Cubbies? A good move. You know, uh, I mean, the, the, let, let me give Theo Epstein's quote. Quote, you know, and of course, I mean, a lot of this stuff is going to be, uh, you know, baseball speak, but we're talking about. A, first of all, they traded a, a great first base prospect, but guess what? They don't need a first baseman. They're not going to need a first baseman He's for not probably play, yeah. quite a few years. So you can afford to make that kind of those kind of moves when you have a loaded farm system, when you have a loaded roster, and you need to pick up bullpen help. We talked about the Cubs needing bullpen help, bullpen help and Montgomery is that guy. Here's the quote from Theo Epstein. Montgomery is someone who has really good stuff and is performing well this year. We think he's coming into his own a little bit. He's someone who can help us this year and long into the future. We paid a price to do that. We uh, traded a couple of really good prospects to get him. But sometimes with these bullpen pieces, it's important to get them on the way there. Maybe he hasn't fully arrived yet. I'm not saying he's Andrew Miller. Very few are. Mm -hmm. We traded for Andrew Miller in Boston when I was there in November 2010, hoping he could put it together in the bullpen someday, and he did. That's how some guys are if you wait until they're fully established. The price tag is virtually impossible to acquire. We're talking about a guy in Montgomery left here hitting a buck sixty-four against him this year. You know, uh, he's at you know thirty relief appearances. He can make a couple of spot starts if they need him. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about a lefty specialist, you're going to need that in October. Sure. And the Cubs just made a move to get it. Yeah, uh, another bad beat for the books. The Rays. Archer gets a win, and they had an easy win at uh, Colorado. Yeah, all of a sudden Tampa's get healthy again. They've won three of their last four. Remember, this team was on a, what were they, lost 20, I think they were 3-22 and 22 at one point. It might have gotten even more than they 3-24. Mm -hmm. I mean, they went through a really, really ugly skid. But now, they're healthy. They've won three of their last four. They got some confidence back. In this game, it was game over by the fourth inning. It was 9-2. to two. Uh, Even at Coors, uh, that's usually a insurmountable lead. Uh, the shortstop, Tim Beckham. Uh, check him out in this photo. How about photo. that? Yeah, yeah. It started the day at hitting a buck seventy-five, <laughs> five for five, hit him up to two thirteen. And of course, as you mentioned, another bad result for the books. Tampa bet up from plus one thirteen. They were a dog in this game, closed in the minus one twenty range. And again, Paulie, this is not unusual for this time of the year. I've talked to you and I have talked to a fair few bookmakers living in Vegas over the years. They always tell you, post All Star break, MLB. When you talk about late July and August, the books can get really beat up around this time of year, and it's happened, obviously, the last couple of days. Man, it was a horrible first half for the sports books because the Cubs, Giants, and the Rangers almost won almost every night, and the public would just parlay them and cover and run lines, and it got ugly. The day wouldn't be complete without one bad beat. The White Sox, who were plus a dollar sixty dogs, had an early four-run lead against King Felix. The bullpen blew it again. 
Oh, yeah. Brutal. You know, King Felix in his first start back off the DL. I talked to a couple of guys uh, yesterday who were real interested in betting the White Sox. They didn't think that King Felix was ready, and he wasn't. You know, it was not the uh, vintage King Felix. There were things to like about that performance, but he gave up a three-run dinger to Todd Frazier in the first on a changeup that just sat in the zone about as fat a pitch as you'll see at the major league level if you see the highlights. 4 nothing in the second. It's 5-2 in the seventh. White Sox all day, plus 160. <laughs> Uh, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> that bullpen give up a dinger in the seventh, a two-run shot in the eighth, and then again in the eleventh. Mariners catch their big minus one eighty ticket, right, Polly? Well, Never in doubt. Never in doubt's right. Small card, but we'll attack big game breakdown up next, and we'll finish it out with the play of the day and finish off the AFC East with the New York Jets on Sports Bit. Betting inside today on SBRPicks.com. Hey, Sports Fit viewers, tune into the MLB Odds Couple Show for uh, today, Thursday, July 21st. I, I, I know this is hard to believe, but Mike and I are both coming off of a winning day. I swear, watch I the saw, show. Look why at is that, that hard to believe? I don't Well, Come on. It's been a long time it's since it's happened. So it's baseball. Could, it could happen once again today, Thursday, July 21st. There's one plan specifically really, really liking and tune into the show. And guess Find what? Find out what it is. College football right around the corner. Don't miss it. All right, big game breakdown as always live odds, sportsbookreview.com. Not much to choose from. Brewers and the Pirates. Garza against Liriano. Pirates $1.75, eight and a half the total. Garza was hoping to pitch well enough this year that he would have been traded and get out of Milwaukee. Fode's not ringing. No, it's not likely to ring either. Uh, you know, he was really hoping to get out of Milwaukee and get bought uh, by a contender. We're talking about a guy who's only 32 years old, but. Mm. He's got over 1,500 MLB innings already. He just looks worn down. Career worst, 6-14 and 14 with a 5.63 ERA last year. And this year, what's he at? 1-3 and three with a 5.74. This is a guy who at one point averaged nine strikeouts per nine innings in a season. Now he's down to 5.5. You know, in 2011, he had a career best swing strike percentage of 11.3. Now that's down to 5.5, which what are we going to call it? Church League softball, Pauly. Uh, I mean, it's not the type of swing strike percentage that we expect when we look again at the bottom five in MLB. There he is. And Fister's pitched well. Cologne's had his moments. So is Tomlin. Garza, uh -huh. not so much on that list. Others have had success because they throw strikes. Garza's walked more than three batters per nine innings so far this season. Then you have Liriano, and it's just been nothing but handling the handing the ball to Hurdle. And how long are they going to allow this to go on for as they're in the wild card race? He falls from 12-7 and seven with a 3-3-8 ERA to 5-9 and nine with an ERA of 5 and change, averaging 5 and a third innings per start. He hasn't made it into the 7th in over two months. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, talking, we're still talking about a guy who has nasty stuff. What he hasn't been able to do is control it this year. You know, last year, 3.4 walks per nine innings. This year, it's up to 5.7 walks per nine innings, most in baseball. And he's missing the plate so badly the hitters aren't chasing his stuff. Yeah. Look at the the numbers right here on this graphic. You know, the percentage of stringing of swing strikes outside the zone. All right. He was getting a lot of those in 2013, in 2014, in 2015. This year, a noticeable decline. And of course. When they wait for more pitches and better pitches, the hitters are making better contact. The swing strike percentage, mm. which was pretty constant, 2013, 2014, 2015, all very good. This year, significantly worse. That's one of the many reasons why Liriano has dropped off so dramatically here in 2016. Excellent numbers there. Live odds, sportsbookreview.com. Game number two, Tigers and the White Sox. Pelfrey against Shields. White Sox $1.30. 10 the total. A big series because Cleveland's threatening to run away with it in the AL Central, and the Tigers just lost two out of three at home to the god-awful Twins. And a month ago, I can't believe we'd, we would have laughed that Shields is favored. Yeah, but, he's, uh, I mean, look, let's talk about the good, you know. He had a disastrous opening with the uh, White Sox. He had a disastrous end to his tenure in San Diego. We mocked him here on Sportsman. Well, guess what? His last four starts... He's 2-2, two and two, nothing to be excited about there. A 1.91 ERA. The two losses came by 1-0 and 2-0 scores. He could very easily be 4-0 and with a 1.91 ERA over those last four starts. Now, the bad, when we look at the good, you know, yeah, he's a composed professional. That's what he's done forever. 
The bad, of course, is that he's doing it all on Guile right now. You know, the stuff just isn't there for Shields the way it was. Only 12 strikeouts and 28.1 innings of work over those four games. Only 20 strikeouts in 42 innings since joining the White Sox. And, of course, when you're giving up that much contact, you have to expect him at some point to struggle. And let's not forget the White Sox bullpen had an awful series in Seattle. Yeah. You know, they led 3 nothing in the ninth, lost on Monday. They led 5-2 in the seventh and lost on Wednesday. And here's a sign that the Tigers are not contenders. They keep sending Pelfrey out there. This is his 19th start. Earlier in the week, the Tigers were only five and a half back. Now they're seven and a half back, and this guy's been one of the worst pitchers in baseball. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can make a case he's been as bad as anybody, as you mentioned. No, yeah. I mean, there's no flukes. He's 2-9 and nine with a 4.95 ERA. And if anything, the ERA is a bit kind. You look at the advanced metric numbers, the fielding, fielding independent pitching, 5.30. The XFIP, 5.16. The Sierra, 5.36. <coughs> excuse me, Paul, but nearly as many walks as strikeouts. When you have 42 walks and 46 strikeouts, that's not a good ratio. His strikeout per nine inning ratio, dead last in all of baseball behind Martin Perez and Jeff Locke and Jared Weaver and Tyler Chatwood, none of whom you want to be on any list with. Uh, Pelfrey, you know, 4.1 strikeouts per nine. That's a ton of contact. And, of course, his last outing was as bad as it gets. Hideous. 1.2 innings against Kansas City. Uh, he faced 14 batters. Nine of them got on base. 29 balls, only 28 strikes. You got that quote there, Paul? I got You're, it. I got it. Here it is. I, I was terrible. I didn't get ahead. Half the guys I faced, I walked. I was terrible. This game's, <laughs> this game's on me. I put the bullpen in a bad spot. I put the offense in a bad spot. I take full responsibility. I was terrible. So I got what I deserved, end quote. Said terrible four times. Don't justify the big contract. Enough already. 19 starts is ridiculous. Cut the cord. I mean, you're five and a half out earlier in the week. What the hell are you doing? Well, we'll talk a little bit about more about this game when it comes to play of the daytime following our deep dive on the New York Jets. All right, it's coming up next on SportsBit. Betty and Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Always on the go? Bet365 has one of the top mobile platforms in today's market. Sign up today and don't let your busy life keep you out of the game. All right, we finish out the AFC East with the JETS, 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 win totals eight. Last year, 10 and six straight up, nine, six and one ATS, eight and eight over under. No playoffs the last five years. The Sanchez took them the AFC title game following the 2010 season with road wins at Indy, New England, and they lost at Pittsburgh. Last year's theme? Feasting on the week. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, again, it's a squad that went 10 wins last year. You look at the wins. They beat the Browns. They beat the Colts, the worst thing the Indies had in years. They beat the Dolphins twice. They beat the Redskins. They were a playoff team, but they beat Washington. And Washington was 2-4, and four, and the Jets were coming off a bye. They beat the Jaguars. They beat the Giants in OT. They beat the Titans, and they beat the Cowboys Yikes. when Dallas didn't have Tony Romo. And what were they, 1-11 without Romo or something? That is the epitome of feasting on the week. They did have a signature win, Week 16 at New England, also in overtime. Every other victory they had all year came versus a struggling squad. And we remember what happened. They needed one win to make the playoffs. Correct. Week 17 against the Bills didn't happen for the New York Jets, which says something about that 10-6 and record maybe a little bit fraudulent. I also want to note right here, Mm -hmm. That eight, the over-under eight on the Jets, I'm telling you right now, that is not going to hold. There has been heavy, heavy money come this past week on the Jets under. Ooh. And a minus 110, well, no, no, you're not going to find so many minus 110s anymore. And that has everything to do with, obviously, what's going on with the quarterback situation for the Jets. Yeah, rightfully so. Geno Smith stinks. Mainstream stats, 10th on offense, 4th on defense, uh, tied for 6th in uh, turnovers, 7th yards per play. Fitzpatrick was 24th in QB rating, career-high 31 touchdowns, uh, his best offensive line, best running game, and best group of wide receivers he's had in his career. And he wants full market. He wants fair value, full, what, what the market. And he looks at Bradford getting $18 million. You see Osweiler gets 18 Kirk, Kirk Cousins gets $20 million. The Jets come out with three years for $24 million. He says, get lost. I'm not going to do it. According to sources, both parties are dug in. And this could last into the preseason. He even got Brandon Marshall saying, I'm texting the guy. I'm worried about him. He's not getting back to me. And the wide receivers are saying, we need this guy on our team. They have no faith in Geno Smith. 
Well, let's talk about what happens if Fitzpatrick does not sign. All right, you have Geno Smith as a starter. You have Bryce Petty and Christian Hackenberg as the backups. Mm -hmm. That would probably rank number 32 out of 32 NFL teams when it comes to quarterback rotations. You know, uh, a guy who's been awful in his very limited time and then two guys who haven't played, you know, one's a rookie one, and another guy, Petty, hasn't played at all. There's no QB situation that's worse than the Jets, and they're lined at eight wins. So, mm. obviously, you're going to see pressure on that number coming down as long as the contract dispute holds between Fitzpatrick and the organization. Now, on the one hand, you agree with Fitzpatrick saying, hey, fair market value, you know, come on. They're lowballing uh, them. You know, on the other hand, Listen to what you just said. He had the 24th, ranked number 24 in QB rating. Even with the best group of receivers, the best running game, and the best offensive line he's ever had. This guy's been a starter for eight years. You know, we think about Fitzpatrick, he's not a starter. Well, eight years now with the Bengals, with the Bills, with the Titans, with the Texans, with the Jets. You know, he's been around the block. He's not getting any better. You know, he's age 33. And I think the Jets were right to turn him down. Look, it helps to have Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker to catch passes. It helps to have Chan Gailey to design an offense. You know, uh, these are things that certainly work in his favor. And I wouldn't be shocked at all if the Jets do sign Ryan Fitzpatrick. But on the other hand, you know, uh, there was a report out that I just read. His house for New Jersey, his house in New Jersey is for rent uh, right now. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't mean necessarily that He's he's moved or he's moving. He didn't, ex- that, he didn't extend the, fact, the lease, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I mean it was a lease yeah. deal, exactly. He yeah. didn't renew the lease on his home, right? Uh, in uh, in Morris County, New Jersey, is uh, according to the uh, NewJersey.com, uh, which is it tells us he doesn't expect to be back. Of course, and Fitzpatrick, in my mind, it's all his fault. You know, he's getting uh, caught on the in a game of musical chairs, and all the other quarterbacks have already found a chair. And guess what? You either sign with the Jets or you're not getting paid anything from anybody because there's not a lot of jobs open. Well, that, now that's true. Open. That's true. That surprised me no, that nobody wanted him. He thought, all right, the Jets, I'll tell the Jets to go pound sand. I'll go somewhere else. No one's been interested in him. And, and again, when he did as he, he, Fitzpatrick performed about as well as he could play last year. And he led the team to 10 wins. But as well as he could play, was still a full yard per pass attempt lower than he had the season before. And whatever situation he's going to go to, I don't know if it's going to be as good as the Jets. The Jets still have a decent offensive line. They've still got a pretty good running game. And they've still got the best group of receivers that Patrick has ever had. From a skill position standpoint, you know, they made that win now move, bringing in Matt Forte Uh in free agency. You know, they traded for Ryan Clady from the Broncos, shore up the offensive line after Jabrickashaw Ferguson retired. Um, You know, I mean, there's some uncertainty on that offensive line coming into camp. Uh, You know, Clady is coming off a torn ACL, but... The biggest uncertainty here is at the court of acquisition. Certainly not on the coaching staff. Great coaches, yeah. Uh, Bowles did a good job. Gailey's back, as you mentioned. So good coaching staff there. They re-signed Wilkerson to a long-term deal alongside Richardson. Elite D-line potential. Not much of a pass rush, though. Revis, well, he's getting up there in age. Looks a step slower. He's still guaranteed $25 million over the next two years. Cromartie bolted, so it's hard to see them being top five in defense. Again, tell us about the schedule. Yeah, and well, let me just talk about the defense real quick here because uh, when, I, when you looked at it, when you read out those stats uh, earlier in the show, we talked about how good the offense was. They were top 10 in everything last year, you know, uh, yards per play, turnovers. A lot of that certainly had to do with schedule, but the bottom line is their stats were real good a season ago. It's hard for me to picture that defense being quite as good this year, even though I am a Casey Rogers fan. Uh, you know, the offense coordinator, defense coordinator, and Bowles all return for their second year on the job. So schedule-wise, and this this is the kicker on the Jets, and this is another reason why we've seen so much under money come of late. 2015, when you grade out the Jets' schedule, and we talked about it earlier, it was the single easiest schedule in the NFL. No team played a week or slate of opponents. That included their two games against New England. In 2016, that schedule is significantly harder than average. So last year was the easiest in the league. This year, it's not just way up to being average, it's a harder than average. It's the number one strength of schedule increased in the NFL. The first six games, they got four of them on the road, five against teams that made the playoffs last year. They will get plenty of TV time. They have two Monday night footballs, a Sunday night, a Saturday prime nine game. 
uh, in Week 16, as well as their Thursday night affair. But when it comes to how tough this year's slate is, you can look at the schedule right here. Not an easy one for the New York Jets. Under only way to look, then. Yeah, and under with right now. urgency. This, okay. <laughs> if you want the under, don't wait another week. Don't wait another month. You know, this is a bet that you want to make sooner rather than later. All right. Money time. Play of the day. Where are we going? Well, it's a game we talked about a little bit earlier in the show. And that, of course, being the Tigers and the White Sox. Let's go. Game number 965, 966, Detroit, Chicago. Over the total. Look at Miguel Cabrera. He should be glad to see James Shields in the American League again because he's knocked him around to a 351 tomb with a couple of home runs. Yep. Neither bullpen is reliable. Even the starters pitch fairly well. Don't trust it to last through nine innings. Look at the Tigers and the White Sox. Over 10. That's our play of the day. All right. We close the week out strong tomorrow. Another division done. All that's left is the NFC East. We got a good MLB card on Friday to discuss. We'll see you then on SportsBit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com.